to Sanchiro's Boys. This is your co-host, Tim Amatuli. And I'm Chris Gote. So today we're discussing an anomaly in Kurosawa's filmography. Those Who Make Tomorrow, his mysterious Lost film. Lost is a little bit, like, it's kind of uncertain, but no one's seen it since it was released, if it was even, like, released or made somehow with two other people. This movie is just all sorts of weird yeah, all I know for sure is that uh, we definitely haven't seen it. <laughs> so it's going to be a little bit tough today on the episode to review this film, because I haven't seen it. I haven't seen a frame from it. I didn't really know anything about it until 10 minutes ago when Tim told me that we're recording this episode. Like Uma, we have barely seen the movie, and yet we're still going to manage to talk about it. Yeah, we at least, we saw Uma, even if we didn't know what the fuck was going on. We saw something, yeah. Oh yeah, I get that's true. It was recorded so bad that it might as well be the lost film. It was a lost cause. Let's just... Get into the plot summary that we could find online, mm-hmm. and then we could start actually discussing what the hell this thing is. Two sisters, one a dancer and the other a script supervisor at a big movie studio, become embroiled in union activities when a strike is called in sympathy with the railroad workers. The girl's father argues with them about their strike, but finds his views changing when he himself loses his job. The father then leads a striker's parade. So, one reason that it's really unfortunate this movie got lost is because it's a leftist film. It's about unions and striking and being a socialist which uh personally <clears throat> behind the, the curtain here i think is cool but <laughs> i'm not exactly sure where this movie's take on all that is but well, what do you know about it all that i've really been able to parse together from reading a little bit about it like one page about it in donald ritchie's book is that Kurosawa was approached by the Japan Motion Picture and Drama Employees Union to make an anti-company anti-capitalist film And, you know, this is right after the war ends and imperialism has failed them and there's all this crazy social restructuring. Japan and now under American occupation, it's just a totally different environment. So he was kind of coerced into working on this movie that he doesn't really seem to have a personal attachment to it. But he's like kind of like, oh, okay. And he's one of three directors. The other two are Kajiro Yamamoto, who was Kurosawa's mentor and the one that co-directed Uma with him. I can see that maybe that was the hook that could have brought him on. And I find it interesting to find him on this movie because he started out making more imperialist movies. And now he's working on like a literal communist production. A, a real 180 there. Yeah, I, mean, I guess it just changes with the time. Imperialism's really cool until it fails and then you're in trouble and you gotta start acting uh, real different real quick. As we might find out in the US uh, sometime in the next 10 years. And then this this other filmmaker, Hideo Sekigawa, this was apparently his first movie. And from what I've been able to find very little about him, but what I've understood is that he's a far left filmmaker cool. who was cast out of Toho Studios in 1948. Not cool. He made a lot of anti-American movies. Very cool. Which like, I get from over there but apparently he took it really far way beyond the realms of legitimate criticism are these available i would love to see them no i can't find any of these apparently whatever this film would be most notable would be hiroshima from 1953 which like i've never even heard of that just sounds like there's probably a thousand movies like that from what i'm getting probably wasn't that good it kind of reminds me of, um, I don't know if you've ever seen, have you ever seen Battle Royale? No, I've been told to see it. I love Battle Royale. It's one of my favorites. The guy who made Battle Royale, Kenji Fukusaku, fought in the war and everything. And, you know, he has all these personal experiences with that. And he starts making Battle Royale 2 and then dies of cancer. And his son, who's totally distraught and for some reason really hates America, turns it into like a pro 9-11 film where he like essentially asserts that blowing up of the Twin Towers is like a battle royale. And that terrorism against civilians is good. As long as it happens to America. And it's this crazy anti-American, anti-logic statement. Is that released? Yeah, I've seen it. It's horrible. It's a terrible, terrible movie. Oh man, I want to see this. And Battle Royale is one of my favorites, so it's even worse. But it's like, huh? And I kind of think of this guy, Hideo Sekigawa, as kind of being like that. This guy who's suddenly thrust into the position of making a movie and has all this weird misplaced anger, but he's not really well studied or educated. He's angry, but his critique yet doesn't make any sense. Yeah, his critique isn't sharp. All I know is I hate America. (laughs) And I I have the book, A Critical Handbook of Japanese Film Directors. He's not even in it. That's a shame. (laughs) So apparently he's not worthy of being put into uh, Alexander Jacoby's book. The gang gets together to make some weird-ass union film on behalf of unions. (laughs) 
<laughs> on, on behalf of who? It's like, Kurosawa didn't have a, a personal vested interest in it. Yeah, well, I mean, people are like, hey, you guys make movies. Let's make this. It seems, it's a little unclear, but it almost seems like they're trying to incorporate the consensus process into the filmmaking. The horizontal anarchist tendency, like, it seems like they're trying to make this anti-capitalist in its creation, in addition to, like, its themes. Is that true, or am I just reading too much into it? Your guess is as good as mine. I think that that's correct, because it is really a movie made by committee, which Kurosawa's like, that is absolutely not the way to do it. Yeah, he would hate the Marvel films. <laughs> <laughs> he said that no movie made like this has ever been good. Yeah, I believe that. <laughs> as much as I love anarchist consensus process i don't think it would be good for movies he's talking about this movie and he only directed about 10 minutes of it so you could hardly call it his own movie well, why are we even reviewing it then i, I don't know because it's, it's it, him co committing <laughs> yeah. stuff to film he, he did more but, for uma <laughs> listen by the end of this this will be the only celluloid he ever created that we have not laid our eyes on that is true the only quote i have from him is he says it is not mine and it's not the other two's either it was really made by the labor union and is an excellent example of why a committee-made film is no good. I did my part in a week and it wasn't too bad for a week's worth. There is a specter haunting the land and it is committee-made films. Man, I feel so bad that he's trashing on unions in this, but I'm sure he had a very bad time, so it's understandable. It is totally, like, antithetical to the process of filmmaking. Unions have a very strong necessity in film, but they don't make the actual movie. They protect the people who make the movie who work for other people. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's what it comes down to. You can't have a film with ten directors. You gotta have one with one director who leads it. You just have to have it done safely. Yeah, even a film made by co-op would still have a director. It would just have a director that people could fire if they wanted. Yeah, and app apparently... It said that the union scenes appear very suddenly and drastically interfere with the film's plot. Weird. I can only imagine as being kind of funny. Like the Spanish Inquisition. He, like, remember when we were watching uh, Monsieur Hulot's Holiday? Yes. That one character who just, like, interjects randomly with stuff about the working class and all that and everyone just ignores him? Yeah, me. That's kind of how I imagine this one going. But it's entire scenes of protest <laughs> rather than, like, a guy with a book. A thousand of them. I like that, though. That's cool. <laughs> I dig it. I think it sounds funny. Like, I just wanted to know what it was like. Yeah, no, I have, I literally can't imagine. Kurosawa had no control over the script, no control over the editing. I'm sure you hated that. Then there were protests that were going on, and apparently some of them got violent, and the union sent Kurosawa to Tokyo's district court to argue on their behalf, and he's like, I don't know what to say. That's deeply funny. I don't really support this. It sounds like a Parks and Rec scenario. Like he's just getting thrust into this weird government position. Yeah, this like bureaucratic structure. I don't know what this is. I have to get out. Hey, the union told me to tell you that... <laughs> Look, just hear them out. Like, <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure that's extremely awkward. Uh, bro, please just listen to the union. Please, I'm sure you'll love it. Please, we're just trying to protect the workers. Please, dude. I tell you, the movie's good, bro. Please. He's so obviously like not the union rep either. Like, It doesn't make any sense for him to be the one that does that, but he was probably just the most charismatic and smart person that they knew. Yeah, he's like the only good filmmaker they had. Yeah. He's, he's the only one they would listen to. And remember, just before this, he was making propaganda for the government. This is really like the death knell and the <laughs> just complete entrapment of his career for like five years. The worst of all those experiences where he had to make these movies they just want to make about stuff he doesn't care about. <laughs> This is just a weird kind of emo phase for Kurosawa. According to the book, it says he ceased believing in groups of people, but believed in individuals. Yeah, that's a weird takeaway from this experience. <laughs> well, I think it, it makes sense in the context of everything. He's such a humanist director, and he cares about the human spirit so much. Yeah, you, that comes through in his filmmaking. He's not a very political filmmaker. He really only focuses on the individual's perception of the problem, or the way that they deal with it, rather than the root cause. That's for other people. That's why he's so beloved in the West. And he doesn't mention any of this in his autobiography, which I find hysterical. It's really funny the movie's not there, and, like, at all. Like, he's just like, nope. Not only that the movie isn't there, but that this entire experience is pretty much not mentioned at all. Like, he mentioned one or two lines about communists and unions and stuff, but it's mostly in regards to his next film with some of the effects that they had on it, which we'll get to next time. Oh, interesting. He doesn't talk about having to go to court or any of that stuff. I feel like that would be definitely something that he would want to mention. Nope. But in the beginning, he's like... Listen, I'm definitely leaving things out. I'm going to skip some stuff. Calls himself out in the autobiography 
I'm sure that I'm not going to portray everything accurately and I'm choosing to leave things out because it's my book. That's allowed. I think it's funny though. I made Sinchero Sagata too. That was kind of weird. And then, uh, <laughs> and then I made Daroga's yeah. for you. <laughs> and yeah, honestly, the only other thing worth noting is that Takashi Shimura was apparently in this as a theater manager. Hell yeah, that's that's kind of cool. My favorite frame is uh, the one with him in it. <laughs> Presumably. My favorite frame was the fourth protest. Good. <laughs> Who knows what this thing would have looked like, but if you think about the epidemic of directors making movies about filmmaking, he kind of did that, but he didn't really do it. Literally like saved by act of God, <laughs> saved by divine intervention. <laughs> this one about filmmaking does not exist. No one has to blame him for it. No one can get mad at him for doing the hokey thing that every director does. He didn't make no day for night or anything. <laughs> Part of being a world-renowned filmmaker is that you have to make it. Yeah. All the way up to, like, Fellini with Eight and a Half, or now recently Quentin Tarantino with Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, or Sunset Boulevard, Singing in the Rain. So many great movies are made this way, but, like, jeez. <laughs> they all do it. He almost did it, but I'm insisting by act of God, he got away with it. This movie doesn't exist, no one has to know about it. And we'll never know what else they got away with. <laughs> but, uh, I guess that's really all it's worth saying about those who make tomorrow. Yeah, those who make tomorrow are the workers, and those who reject tomorrow are the employers. No truer words have ever been spoken. That's something I agree with. Amen. Yeah, I, I really would love to see it. Oh, me too. I feel like we could have, like, a Sanchiro Sugata Part 2-esque experience if this movie was ever found. Yeah, just this fever dream of a film where, like, three people are making it. doesn't make sense what's going on. <laughs> that would be fun. People aren't really sure if this film is lost, lost, like, every print of it is gone, or if it's just not available. Suppressed. No one has wanted to restore it or release it or, any, or show it. Yeah, film just no one cares about. It hasn't been seen outside of its initial run, which apparently wasn't good because no one cares about it. Yeah, but I mean, it had initial runs. So it got more or less finalized. This movie theoretically exists, but we have nothing to show for it other than the poster. The poster is the only thing that's real. Yeah, I mean, it's probably in some basement in Japan. There's lots of movies like that that almost exist. Yeah, which are usually shelved for good reason. Yeah, but uh, oh well. So that's that. We're not gonna, you know, take too much time here. And, um, you know, we'll be back to our regularly scheduled programming with no regrets for our youth in a couple days. So until then, keep it tight. Yeah, join a union.